This is part one of a screencast on energy and enzymes for microbiology. Before we can talk about metabolism in our cells, we have to talk about energy. Energy is used to make things move. Uh, and that includes making and breaking chemical bonds. Energy can be stored as potential energy, or it can be the energy of motion, kinetic energy. The biggest and most important part of energy in our cells is ATP. ATP has a ton of stored energy when it exists as ATP. When ATP gets hydrolyzed to ADP, all of that stored energy gets released in a giant burst of kinetic energy, and that energy is used to power things in our cells. When atoms or molecules react, they have to hit one another in order to react. And they have to hit one another with a certain amount of energy for that reaction to occur. There's a law in chemistry, or a theory rather, called collision theory that states that atoms, ions, or molecules can react to form products when they collide if the particles have enough kinetic energy but only if the particles have enough kinetic energy. That special amount of kinetic energy that the particles have to have to power the reaction is called activation energy. Activation energy is defined as the minimum amount of energy colliding particles must have in order to react. Okay? We can think of activation energy as a barrier to a chemical reaction. A lot of times when we're looking at activation energy, we look at graphs like this. This is a graph of a chemical reaction proceeding over time and the amount of energy in the system. So we start with our reactants, right? They're about in the middle of the graph. And then there's this huge input of energy needed or this big hill here that we see before the reactants can go down to products. This big hill is your activation energy. If that hill is too big, then a chemical reaction is really unlikely to occur. Obviously, chemical reactions in our cells are very important. So our cells have developed ways to make that hill smaller so that it can be climbed easier, if you will. Something that lowers activation energy is called a catalyst. It makes the hill smaller. Metals are good catalysts, but what we're gonna talk about is enzymes. If you look at these two different pictures of activation energy, you can see that the path without the enzyme or the uncatalyzed path, those are very, very large hills. When you have the enzyme present, that hill gets much, much, much smaller. Okay, so enzymes work by lowering activation energy. What is an enzyme? An enzyme is a protein with a very, very specific three-dimensional structure. And they interact with very specific particles that are called substrates. The substrates will bind into the enzyme at a very special specific place called the active site. Enzyme part two. So the substrate binds to the active site in the enzyme like a key in a lock. And that bond is very, very specific. Only the right key will unlock a lock. When chemical reactions happen, bonds need to be broken and then new bonds get made. That initial bond breaking is usually what requires that great input of activation energy. Enzymes lower the amount of activation energy needed by putting stress on those bonds. If you put stress on a bond, it'll break easier. Once the chemical reaction has occurred, the enzyme then spits out the products 
and then the enzyme is free to go on and make more chemical reactions happen. Here's a picture of what that looks like step by step. Okay, so first the substrate binds in the active site. Okay, the enzyme does work on the substrate, puts stress on those chemical bonds, and makes them break easier. And then the chemical bonds break, the new bonds that are going to form form, and then the substrate has been transformed into products. Those products then leave the enzyme and the enzyme is empty and free to go on and do more enzyme work. Important things to remember about enzymes. That three-dimensional shape is super, super, super important. If the enzyme loses that shape, then the shape of the active site will change and the substrate won't be able to bind anymore. Remember that enzymes are proteins, so a denatured protein will not function. Structure is essential for function in proteins. And this is another example of that. Enzymes will not work if they're denatured at all, even a little bit. Another thing that's important to remember is that enzymes are not used up in chemical reactions. Once those products come out, new substrates can come in. So enzymes can do work over and over and over again. Another thing that makes it easy to tell when a molecule is an enzyme is that the name usually ends in ACE, A-S-E. Here's a real life example. This big purple glob is the enzyme sucrase. See it ends in A-S-E. In its active site can bind sucrose. A lot of times the name of an enzyme will be somehow related to the substrates or products. So sucrase breaks down sucrose. Okay? Sucrose is glucose and fructose bound together. Once the sucrose binds into the active site of sucrase, that bond gets weakened and the glucose and fructose can break apart from one another. Here's a couple other pictures of computer generated models of this protein. You can see the substrate fits right inside that active site perfectly. It gets a little more complicated than that. Some enzymes need help in order to function. Okay. If you are an enzyme that needs a little bit of help in order to function, maybe you need an extra piece um, besides your substrate, you're called an apoenzyme. You're inactive without your extra piece, which is called a cofactor. A cofactor is a non-protein component of an enzyme that an enzyme needs in order to be functional. Things like zinc, iron, magnesium, calcium, Cofactors can be coenzymes, which are organic things like vitamins or electron donors or electron acceptors. All of those things could be cofactors to help an enzyme do its work. Energy and enzymes part three. Once you have all of the pieces of your enzyme, your apoenzyme and your cofactor together, you have a functional unit called a holoenzyme. That holoenzyme can then bind to the substrate and the enzyme can do its work. How well your enzyme works is influenced by temperature. Okay, When temperature increases in a chemical reaction, the particles are moving more. When they're moving more, they're more likely to slam into one another. So the rate of reaction or the enzymatic activity rate increases as temperature increases, but only to a certain point because if the temperature increases too far, your enzyme will denature. Different enzymes, as you can imagine, have different optimum temperatures. The optimum temperature for an enzyme in the human body would be somewhere around human body temperature. Okay, If you were a bacteria that lives in a volcanic hot spring,
your optimal temperature is probably going to be quite a bit hotter than an enzyme in the human body. We know that very high temperatures denature enzymes. They can break the hydrogen bonds. Um, they can cause the active site shape to be lost, or they can completely denature the protein if it gets too hot. Sometimes this is reversible if the temperature cools back down, but not always. Enzymes also have specific pHs that they work really well at. If you get too far acidic or basic on your pH scale, you will have a loss of function. Uh, extreme pHs can cause enzymes to be denatured. And if you're measuring the rate of enzyme activity, that can be influenced by how much substrate you have. If you don't have a lot of substrate, your enzyme won't have a lot of work to do, so it will make products at a fairly slow rate. If you increase the concentration of your substrate, it will increase how many products are being put out up to the point where the enzyme is saturated. When an enzyme is saturated, it essentially, as soon as it spits out products, a new substrate comes in right away. There's not much gap time there. So that, at that point, you'll see um, in an enzyme saturation curve, you'll see it, the curve plateau, meaning that it's going as fast as it can and it can't possibly go any faster. Most enzymes, though, um, in cells are not normally saturated. One cool thing about enzymes is that you can shut them off by using different chemical inhibitors. Inhibitors can be either competitive or non-competitive. A competitive inhibitor will compete with the substrate for the active site. Okay? This can bind reversibly or irreversibly, meaning that the competitive inhibitor can come back out. But when that competitive inhibitor is in the active site, the substrate can't bind. The other kind of competition is non-competitive. So an inhibitor that's non-competitive will bind somewhere else on the enzyme other than at the active site. When that non-competitive inhibitor binds, it causes a very slight shape change in the enzyme, just enough so that the substrate can no longer get into the active site. Remember, it's a very specific bond between substrate and active site, and even the smallest change can make that not happen anymore. Enzymes and energy, part four. Enzymes in our cells can often work in long chains of enzymatic reactions called a pathway, where one product of an enzymatic reaction is the substrate of the next, and this goes on and on and on. Something cool our cells can do is shut off this pathway by having one of the end products of one of the enzymes toward the end of the pathway inhibiting an enzyme at the beginning of the pathway. This is called feedback inhibition, and it's really helpful, and it helps ensure that our cells don't make more of something than it needs. Okay? Resources are limited. Energy is limited. We could use those substrates for other things if they're not being made into products by an enzyme. Okay, so feedback inhibition inhibits a chain of enzymes by a product at the end or near the end inhibiting an enzyme at the beginning. Here are some enzymes that are relevant to microbiology that we either have learned about already or we will learn about coming up. Catalase, we've already learned about, used by bacteria that metabolize in the presence of oxygen breaks down harmful oxygen radicals like hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas. DNA polymerase, super important for DNA replication. We'll talk more about that. Sucrase catalyzes the breakdown of sucrose into glucose and fructose. Uh, we saw an example of that earlier in these slides, and some bacteria have sucrase and some don't. Okay, Same thing with citrate lyase. Some bacteria have it and some don't. It's a really helpful tool for identifying bacteria. It catalyzes the breakdown of citrate. Remember, whatever comes before the ACE in the name of the enzyme is usually related to what it breaks down. Other enzymes. 
beta galactosidase. This one is actually pretty cool. It breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose uh, for lactose fermentation. When lactose is plentiful, certain bacteria like E. coli can turn on the gene for beta galactosidase to make more of this enzyme. And when it's not present, E. coli can turn it off so that it's not making an enzyme that it can't use anyway. Ornithinine decarboxylase helps us break down uh, an amino acid. Another one that helps us break down an amino acid is phenylalanine deaminase. Other enzymes, amylase, you're probably pretty familiar with. This is an enzyme in our spit that helps break down starch. It is one of those enzymes that um, gets the digestive process going. It's also made by our pancreas. Gelatinase breaks down gelatin into smaller um, peptides or just chunks of protein. Uh, the presence of this enzyme in multiple bacteria is why we grow bacteria on agar and not gelatin. Okay. Another amino acid that some bacteria can break down and some can't is cysteine. If they have the enzyme cysteine desulfhydrase, that enzyme takes the sulfur off from the cysteine amino acid, starting the breakdown of that amino acid. Okay, we can also test for that in the lab. Tryptophan, everyone associates tryptophan with turkey. Well, the long story short of it is that there isn't enough tryptophan in turkey to actually make you tired. And at Thanksgiving, you really get tired because you just gorged yourself and overeat like crazy, which I don't recommend, by the way, uh, but we all do it. Um, tryptophanase breaks down tryptophan into a few different things, indole, ammonia, and pyruvate. All of those can be used in the cell. Photolyase, remember when UV light created those thymine dimers in um, bacterial cells and killed them? Well, an enzyme photolyase can break those thymine dimers up and save the cell before it dies. All right, let's summarize everything.